Hi friends, my name is Noel, and I'm going to start a weekly vlog, um, and in this vlog I want to talk to you guys about things uh, that God has been teaching me in His Word, things that I want to share, things that I'm excited about, and so I'm starting this vlog today, is the first day, this is the first video, and um, I hope that you are blessed, and maybe uh, that you'll learn something or that you'll gain a deeper appreciation of a, a truth that you already know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here outside of my home. Um, just want to show you guys the view before I start. It's a beautiful day. Um, yeah, that's Moreno Valley. And... Uh, the hills are green, the flowers are arriving, spring is here. So, so today I want to talk to you about this question, what does God look like? And when we ask that question, what does God look like? I'm not talking about the physical sense of what God looks like, but I'm talking about what are God's characteristics? Who is God? And because God is eternal and because He's infinite, you know, we can never fully describe God. You can't encompass God in a description or in uh, simply, you know, one set of attributes. Or, you know, there's language would fail to describe God. I mean, you can, he's infinite. So when you ask that question, what does God look like? There's really no complete answer. But I do want to look at, um, you know, some things in the Bible that we can, we can see a little clearer picture of what God looks like. And, um, you know, in, in Genesis, here I have my Bible, I'm going to turn here in Genesis, chapter 1. In the very beginning of the Bible, there's a story of creation, and you, you may remember this verse. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. <clears throat> then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the sea fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That was Genesis 1, 26 through 28. So God here says, I want to pick out a key phrase here, which is when God says, let us make man in our image. And here we receive uh, something about God, you know, when he says, let us. And what we receive is God doesn't say, let me make man in my image. He says, let us make man in our image. You know, God is a trinity. He's, he is not an individual. He's actually a family. It's the family of the Godhead. And he made the human family in his image. He made the human family the marriage relationship to reflect who he is. Just like the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit have a relationship. You know, Adam and Eve, they had a relationship. They had children. They had a, a relationship. So it was a community. And that's who God is. He's a community. He's not an individual. Let us make man in our image. Um, and even though, uh, you know, God is, He's three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, 
So, so he's he's a plural. Okay, we're gonna get to the next point here. So, the next point is that he made man in his image. And that word man, I heard this preacher say once that that word man is not a man in a um, in an individual sense like that man there. You know that that's more of like the word mankind. So let us make man in our image. So he's saying, let us make human beings. Let us make people in our image. And then it says male and female, he created them. So he made Adam and Eve in his image. Um, and like I said, that marriage relationship reflects who he is. And we, we get a little deeper understanding here when we go to chapter 2 uh, in verse 24. It says, uh, this is talking about Adam. Well, let me go back. Verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we, we just read that God created male and female in his image. Now we read that Adam... And Eve, his wife, they become one flesh. They shall become one flesh. And that's the picture of God that we receive here in Genesis. That God is, Adam and Eve were two individuals, but they were one flesh. In that marriage covenant, they became united. They were emotionally, spiritually, physically united as one being, even though they were two distinct individuals with two different minds, different roles, uh, different personalities, yet they were one. And, and that's what God made in His image to reflect Him. Um, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So, you know, there we get the same characters of God is that God is one, yet in Genesis we see he is plural. God is, he's a community, yet he's one. And in other words, he's united. He's, he, he's one in the sense that it's many individuals that are united in their purpose, united in love, united in in their desire okay so and that that's what a family is supposed to be that that's a reflection of god so god is he's a community yet he's one that's um that's what god looks like and and i want to talk about um, something that Jesus said in, in the book of John. So, in John 17, there's a long prayer by Jesus. And <clears throat> Jesus prays for his believers. And I want to read you uh, something he says there. So, I'm going to turn here to John 17. And I'm going to read verse 20. Onwards, it says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So, <clears throat> Jesus is praying for his disciples and he's praying for those who will believe in him and his prayer is that they, his believers, his disciples may all be one just as the Father and he are one. He wants us to be one with each other and he wants us to be one with him. So let's ponder that concept a little bit because that's a deep concept. You know, we just read that um, we just read that God is one. He wants us to be one. And, you know, imagine what that would be like for us as human beings, as God's believers, to be 
one with each other. One even to the point of being as close to each other as one in purpose and in mind and in love as the Father is to the Son. Um, and also imagine the, the, the concept well, before I talk about that, so, you know, that's what Jesus prays. He prays for us to be united with each other as, as one. And then he says something interesting. He says that the world may believe that you sent me. That the world may believe that you sent me. So he says, I want the believers to be one so that people will believe in me. And... You know, in order to understand that, we have to go back to the fact that God is one. And what Jesus is basically saying is, He needs us, His church, He needs us, His believers, to show forth His image. We need to show the world what God looks like. And we do that by being one with each other. Many different individuals from many cultures, many different backgrounds, different social classes, different races, different generations. When we come together as individuals and yet we're united in our love for each other, in our love for God, in when we're united in our purpose, uh, you know, which is to share the gospel with the whole world, the world is going to see what God looks like because that's who God is. He is he is three individuals, yet united as one. We need to have that same relationship with each other. Then, when the world sees that, they will believe in Jesus because they will see the demonstration of who Jesus is, not only hear about it. Um, and the other part to that is he says that they also, that the believers also may be one in us. Talking about himself, God. So, you know, Jesus prays not only that we would be united with each other as one, but that we would be united with Him as one. Um, you know, imagine you being as one with the Father as Jesus was one with the Father when He walked on earth. Imagine being that close, being that united with God. Jesus says, I don't do anything of myself but only what the Father tells me to do. I don't say anything of myself, but only what the Father tells me to say, only what He has given me to say. You know, the Holy Spirit, He does not speak of His own, but He speaks of what is Jesus's, and He gives it to us. So they are just totally, they don't have their own um, will apart from each other. Their will is totally united. It's one will. They desire the same thing. They do the same thing, and... You know, Jesus prays that for us. He says, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So Jesus is praying and he desires, it's his will that we be one with God, just as he is one with God. In other words, the Father wants to be so close to you. He wants to be just as close to you as he is with his son, Jesus Christ. He wants to be one with you, a mere mortal, just as he is one with his Godhead. That's the type of unity that God desires. Um, when we're one like that with God, and we're one like that with each other, the world is going to receive a clear image of what God looks like. God is going to be living through us. And through many individuals, you know, they're gonna see the love that occurs. And I think that's what's really gonna convince people of the truth of God's love is when they see it demonstrated, you know. Um, when they see that, they're gonna understand uh, that it's divine. It's, it's not by a human power or idea that that kind of unity can exist. And the world's going to understand that. You know, I think we have to... Um... Oh, yeah, and, and one last thought on that is, you know, unity is the strongest witness. You know, just right here from this verse, 
um, he also says right after this verse he says uh, the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in unity and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me so Jesus says when we're perfect in unity when the believers are perfect in unity the world will know that God sent Jesus the world will know that God loves them when we love each other. So unity is the strongest witness, and I've experienced this in my own personal life as well, how, you know, truth, doctrine without love does not attract people. And most people, you know, they're not just searching for what is true and what is right you know they want to be loved that's what people want that's what people need and when we when there's a community of people who love each other and who will love people who are on the outside and who come visit or who are brought into that community that's going to make them want to stay that's what attracts people to Christianity. That's what attracts people to God when they see his love. Um, and love expresses itself through unity, through oneness. That is the expression of love, oneness. So when that is expressed, when there's a community that is united, when there's a group of believers that is united, people are gonna wanna join that group. People, I've seen it happen. You know, people just feel attracted and even it's happened to me where I felt um, a new level of joy and um, just a new level in the Christian walk when not only am I walking with God but I'm walking with another community of believers who are united in the faith and love that's that's a um, a joy that you know I've never experienced anywhere else so unity is the strongest witness because it most clearly and most directly reveals who God is more than words, more than, more than a single individual can, you know, just one individual. You can be a godly person and you can definitely be used by God, but, um, y you know, you as one individual cannot fully you know, represent the character of God unless you have a community because God is not an individual. He's a community. Um, and, you know, just just to close, um, you know, I think we should meditate on on that concept of us being one with God and basically what that means is that we don't have anything in our hearts, don't have anything in our lives that are not of God. We don't have any thoughts that are not of God. Um, that we wouldn't do anything that Jesus Christ himself wouldn't do if he was walking on this earth. That's what it means to be one with God. Um, so, you know, we need to meditate on that. We need to, to examine ourselves and ask ourselves and see whether, you know, what is in our life that is not of Jesus Christ? What is in our hearts that, you know, is an abomination to God? You know, whatever it is, we need to let those things go. We need to ask God to purify us in order that we can become one with God, in order that our will can become the same as His will, that we desire the same things that He desires, that we hate the same things that God hates, which is pride, which is sinful desires, you know, which is, you know, treating each other with hatred and bitterness, um, you know, all those things of the flesh that God hates. We need to learn to hate those things instead of loving them. We need a true transformation. We need to be born again in the Holy Spirit um, with a new desire uh, to become a new creation. So. You know, let's ask God to do that. And, and remember, that's, that's, you know, a summation of, of what salvation is. It's a process of returning to the image of God. It's a process of becoming one with God again. And if there's something that 
that you're holding on to that is not of God, remember, you know, if you want to allow God to continue to work in your life, you need to let that go. You know, you need to just give God full reign in order that He may make you just like Him, that He may live in you, that your will may become the same as His will. So, so that's the um, that's the topic for today. What does God look like? He He is He is three, and yet He is one in love, uh, perfected in unity, and He wants us to to show His image to the world by demonstration, um, which is going to be what is ultimately going to to finish the work. The you know Jesus is never going to come until His church is united in as one, just like He and the Father are one, and. And the other part to that is, you know, you know, he has to live in us in order for that to happen because we can't do that ourselves. So that's what God looks like, um, you know, according to what we've we've read. Um, of course, that's that's an open-ended uh, topic that could go on in many different um, attributes of God. But that's just one I wanted to touch today. And uh, thank you for listening. And um, I hope you gain something out of that. And I'll see you next week with the next video.